Hello, everyone, and welcome to Self-Editing for Fiction. This is part of my Storycraft series. I am Katie Salitis, and today we're going to break down what it is to self-edit your book or revise your book. All right, so to begin, we're going to talk about what self-editing is. Now, self-editing is not what your editor does. The editor is the one who goes through and makes sure that you are grammatically perfect, your punctuation is exactly where it's supposed to be, and the sentences read very cleanly and are easy to understand when the book is published so that it is ready for mass market consumption. Self-editing is a form of revising that helps you clean up your manuscript. This is the part that comes after your first draft. This could be your second, third, or fourth draft however many drafts you need in order to get that book to where it's ready to move on to the next phase of publishing. What we do with self-editing is we seek out and we destroy unnecessary words. We remove lazy modifiers that make our, our sentences sound boring. We trim out the fat on those extra wordy sentences and we swap out some words for ones that might be a little bit more creative. First thing in this process is what I like to call seek and destroy. And this is where we locate the word or words that really don't belong in your sentences and actually make the sentences read a lot more cleanly. How do we do that? Well, depending on if you're using Microsoft Word or if you're using a Google Docs, um, I believe Apple's Pages also has the same function. You would use Control H in order to bring up your find and replace screen. So find and replace is what we use to seek and destroy. This is where we can locate words or phrases and we can quickly spot those in our manuscript to clean those up. Now, what are we searching for? For starters, we're gonna look at bloat words. Now, bloat words are words that we add to sentences that add no value to the sentence. And in most cases, when we remove that word, we don't have to change the sentence at all. We can simply snip the word out and the sentence reads just as cleanly. Some of the biggest uh, culprits in the word bloat is the word really. And you see an example up here. You don't really need this word. It doesn't really add to the sentence. Cut out the word really, what do you have? You don't need this word. It doesn't add to the sentence. A simple snip makes the sentence a little bit cleaner. Just as another one of those bloat words that, uh, unless it's in dialogue, doesn't really add to the sentence. Now, the caveat with dialogue is that in dialogue, it's used to convey how a character speaks. So this rule doesn't apply when it comes to dialogue. This is just in your narrative. So if we look at the sentence, she just wanted to check on her son. We don't need that word just. Taking it out, quick snip, she wanted to check on her son. The sentence has not been altered in any meaningful way, but we have cut down on a word that was bloating the sentence. Words like start or begin, timing words. Those words a lot of times are more telling than they are necessary. And by removing them, we can, again, trim out that fat. We can make our sentences look a little cleaner. In our example here, we have the boy started to cry. With a quick snip, the boy cried becomes a little more active. Now, if you wanna take that a little bit further and revise that sentence, you could say a fat tear streamed down the boy's face. Now we know that the boy is crying, but we've got a better visual to go along with that. So in this self-editing process, in this revising process, what we're doing is making our words clearer. We are making our sentences better. Let's look again at that word really. Now, this is an example from one of my short stories. Um, I'm giving you a real world example so you can see, yes, I make these mistakes. And when I go through and I do my self editing, these are the things I actually look for. So in this one page snippet here, you can see that I have four uses of the word really. Let's go through and see if they need to be there, if we can snip them out. In example number one, Aiden will be a great leader and I could have time to really consider what is being asked of me. Does really belong in there? I'll leave that one for you to decide. In the next, next example and in the following example, which we're going to touch on echoes a little bit later, we have, I really did not like the sound of that. Does really need to be in there? I'll leave that up to you. Do we cut or do we keep? Last example on this one, that was really the biggest concern I had. Again, do we cut it or do we keep it? Is it necessary in these sentences? And this is what you're going to ask yourself as you're going through the self-editing process. Take a look for these bloat words and see if you really 
need them or not. Moving on. Let's look at another one of the bloat words, just. Just again, one of the biggest culprits. We've got four more examples for you. Boos, and yes, that is the name of, of a cat. That was the name of a cat, rest in peace, um, who I did own, and so she was immortalized in words. But here we go. Example one. Boos began to paw at the fresh glop of regurgitated fur, as if trying to cover up the mess that she had just made. Do we cut or do we keep? Does just need to be in there? If we take it out, is it going to make a difference in the sentence? Example number two. She bent down and showed Boos the mess she had made, as if the cat could understand that it had just ruined her evening. Do we cut or do we keep? Does it really need to be in that sentence? Number three. We will just have to improvise. Do we cut or keep? Without the just in there, we will have to improvise. Does that sound better? Does that sound more active? I leave it up to you. These are the questions you ask when you're going through self-editing. Does this word really need to be there? And example number four, she was a collector and not just high-priced stilettos either. Do we cut or do we keep? Now, in these instances, you're not always going to cut, but in the self-editing process, you are making the determination. Is my writing as clear as possible? Is the sentence reading the best way it could possibly read? That is what the self-editing process teaches us. Next, we move on to lazy modifiers. And the reason we call them lazy is because they could be better. We could find other ways of saying something. We just threw in the first word that we thought would fit in there. And the biggest culprit of those is very. Now, this list that you see on the screen here is not a complete list. For a full alternate word list, I do have that available in my book, just edit and write the damn book and that is available on Amazon but let's go through this real quick so very is used when we want to emphasize something right we have very amusing very bad very boring very busy we use very without even thinking about it and that's what makes it a lazy modifier instead of saying we are very happy we could say we're ecstatic elated joyful Instead of being very annoyed, we could be aggravated, we could be frustrated. We don't need the word very if we use a better word. So by going through your manuscript, and again, using that find and replace function, search for the word very, and then go to your alternate word list and see, is there a better word I could have used that makes that sentence more impactful, more powerful, without having to use that word vary without having to lean on it. Another way we get lazy is we tell people using filtering words. We tell them what the character is thinking, feeling, hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, instead of giving them the experience of what they are going through. And when we write, we are trying to convey through a character's eyes. So if the character is experiencing that, instead of telling the reader, that the character is experiencing something, why don't we help the reader experience it with them? And to do that, we can't just simply remove a word. We can't search and destroy these out. What we need to do is search them out and we need to restructure. We need to find a better sensory word. So let's look at a few examples of better sensory words. We're gonna talk about sounds right now. And I want you to read these sentences and see what you could fill in the blanks in order to give us the sound without telling us that somebody is hearing the sound. And on the, uh, the left-hand side here, again, this isn't a full sensory word list. This is just an example sensory word list for you. In my book, there is quite a few different lists available, so you definitely want to check that out. But let's look here at our first example. My cat always chooses midnight for his playtime. I've gotten used to the random blank and blank as he performs what can only be described as feline gymnastics. What can we fit in there? We could use crashes and bangs to show that the cat is bumping into things or knocking things over. We could use the chimes if the cat's running into something like a wind chime and making it tinkle in the air. So using those sensory words, giving us something to tell us what something is sounding like, gives us the experience. And that's what we want the reader to have, is the experience of being there with the character. So, fill in the blanks exactly as you would like to. Let's move on to the next sentence. After having children, you become numb to blank and blank. The only time to be concerned is when there's blank. 
So any mothers out there or fathers who are used to the sounds that kids make when they're just out of eyesight, you know, there's a lot of crashing, a lot of banging, a lot of screaming, a lot of clatter. There's a lot of noisy words we could be throwing into this sentence to really give that feeling of what kind of sounds that this is trying to convey. What sounds would you put in there? Fill in the blanks yourself and see what you come up with. Play with it a little. Give yourself a, a few different words to fit into those blanks. And you'll see as you get into the habit of replacing these sensory words with better ones, that when you go through your self-editing process, it becomes a little more natural. Let's do another example here. We're going to do smells this time. So again, you're going to see on the, the side here, there's a list of unpleasant smells. Now, I do have a list of pleasant smells as well, but for now, let's just focus on some of the unpleasant ones as we fill in the blank. Again, we're not using the word smell in the sentence. We're going to use a describing word for that smell. So the overpowering blank of blank floated on the breeze and made my nose crinkle. So the overpowering fetid stench, the nauseating odor of bile. You can come up with a lot of really nasty, disgusting words that you can fit into these blanks without saying it stunk. It makes your writing a lot more impactful. The teenager's room. How many of us have teenagers out there? The teenager's room. Blank of blank so bad I thought someone might have died in there. I'm sure we can all understand that one if we've ever dealt with teenagers, especially teenage boys. So it could be a sour stench that smells of rotting eggs, you know, food that has been going bad on the, uh, the end table that they left there next to their bed, you know, something nasty and stinky, pungent odors. We can really fill in the blanks with some of these nasty words and make that sentence really pop. And that's, again, that's what we're trying to do here. Let's do another example. We're going to do a word swap, this time using tactile words. So touch, the sense of touch. What does something feel like when you touch it? Is it abrasive? Does it grate at your skin? Is it silky and luxurious? Is it slimy or spongy? Now, those of you with kids, you guys are very well familiar with slimy, spongy, goopy sensations that you don't necessarily want an answer to what that could possibly be. So use that, lean into that. I reached my hand into the bag and touched something blank. Did you touch something moist? Did you touch something soft, squishy, velvety, bubbly? Fill in the blanks with what word you want to put in there and play around with it. Again, the, the words that you choose are going to have an impact on the sentence and the way that your readers are going to read these sentences. So you can really help guide them through your own word choice. Let's try an example again here. No wonder the dress cost a fortune. The blank fabric the designer used was so blank. The luxurious fabric, the lacy fabric. What kind of fabric are we talking about? Use that tactile sense. The lacy fabric the designer used was so what? What would you put in there? Would it be fluffy? Would it be itchy? Would it be limp, stiff, scratchy? What does lace feel like in your fingertips? What would you put there? One more here. We're going to swap out the word walk now because that's another one that we tend to use. It becomes the lazy modifier. We just throw walk in everywhere when we're talking about movement. But we don't need to always use walk. We can describe how somebody is moving instead of just saying they walked across the room. So after breaking my leg, I had to blank around. Are you hobbling around? Are you lumbering around? Are you limping? How are you moving with a broken leg? Example number two, I blank across the room quietly, not wanting to wake anyone up. How would you move across the room silently? Would you tiptoe? Would you skulk across the room? Would you pussyfoot across the room? Depending on how you want to convey that movement, you can change the word in multiple ways and create that impactful sentence. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to create the impact for the reader. We want them to really experience with our character what is going on. And that is exactly what we're talking about in this self-editing process, making it clearer, making it easier for the reader. 
Next up, we want to trim the fat. And this is one of my favorite areas when it comes to self-editing. When we're trimming the fat, a lot of times we're talking about echoes. And I am just as guilty of this as the next person. We have crutch words. We have words that we lean on all the time, the comfortable words that we use. And when we use these words over and over, we're creating an echo. And if you think about like a record player, and you've got that record going, and there's a scratch. One scratch doesn't really make a big difference. But if that needle continues to hit the scratch over and over and over and over, you notice that scratch. And it becomes very apparent. And it pulls you out of the music that you're listening to because the scratch is now all you can hear. That is what an echo is to your reader. When they see the same word or the same sound or a similar word over and over and over, they start to notice that word and it pulls them out of being in experience with the character. We don't wanna do that. So we have a couple different types of echoes that we look for. The obvious echo, as the example up here shows, is repeating the same word in a very, very close proximity to the first use. So the room was a small child's bedroom. And yes, this is obvious, for example, I'm doing this to let you see what it looks like in a small space. When you're looking at it in your manuscript, it's gonna be a little harder to spot, but you can still do it. So here we have the room repeated twice. Now I didn't repeat room as a single word twice, but I used that root room twice, room and bedroom. In the same sentence, you hear it. Next example, damn, he was smooth. And with looks to match, no, she couldn't fall for the smooth talking. So here we have a couple of different sentences, but they're short sentences. And we have the word smooth being repeated very close to itself. It starts to become noticeable that you could have put a better word in there. You could have changed it. And the, note, or the echo of smooth would not be there. It would not be why are we repeating this word? It, it wouldn't stick in the back of your mind. Next one, we protect magic and the community of magical beings. Again, using magic twice in one sentence. These are obvious echoes. Again, when you're looking at your manuscript as a whole, the echoes aren't always going to be that close together. But when you do notice that you're repeating words, that's the time for you to start restructuring and changing so that you spread those out and you don't create that broken record uh, scratch effect. Now, this also happens in rhyming. This isn't in poetry. Poetry does not have the same echo issue. So please do not apply that to poetry. This is just in your narrative fiction. So when you say something that has a similar sound to it, you have that rhyming sound that also has an echo effect. So I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. I'm sure we all know that phrase. That would be considered an echo because poet and know it have the same sound. At first, he was unknown, but now he's totally in the zone. Again, same sound repeated very close together becomes an echo. One more time. He gets a prize if he tries. Same sound, very close together, becomes very noticeable. And the more you do this, the more it's going to feel like you're being repetitive. You're saying the same thing over and over, and that makes your writing feel a little less polished. So self-editing process is all about cleaning up and making things good, uh, making your words clear and concise, and making sure that your characters are experiencing things for your reader. Don't give them reasons not to pay attention to that. Now, echoes are not completely avoidable. You're never going to get rid of all of them. But when you start to notice them and you can actively space them out, you won't interrupt the cadence of your work. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to slim out those echoes so that they're not as noticeable. It becomes the occasional record scratch instead of the constant every rotation record scratch. Now, you can also have echoes in the way that you write too. If you choose a first person point of view, you can have echoes by using that I word over and over and over because in first person, it's all about me. I am the character. So let's do an example here. I knew it was inadvisable to walk around the streets alone at night, but I did not have a car. So I was forced to do it anyway. I carried my keychain of pepper spray for defense, just in case. I ran into anyone dangerous. I naively believed in its ability to protect me from any attacker. So do we see how many eyes were in that sentence there? Or excuse me, that paragraph? That is also considered an echo. And I know what you're saying. It's first person. I'm going to use I. How do I avoid that? Well, the tip here 
is when you're writing in first person to actively tell yourself, I need at least a sentence gap between my eyes. If you can actively tell yourself to have that sentence or two gap between the eyes, you will restructure it so that those eyes are less apparent. Here's a revised version of that same paragraph. It was inadvisable to walk the streets alone at night. I knew this, but didn't have a car, so there was no other choice. For defense, I carried a keychain of pepper spray, naively believing in its ability to protect me from any attacker. So we went from six eyes down to two in that paragraph, just by giving ourselves some gap space. And that's just actively telling yourself, okay, let me look for the eyes. Let me make sure I've got a gap between my eyes. That's all you have to do there. Let's look at it in third person because third person, we end up running into the he, 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 she, she, she echo. So let's look at an example here. Third person, Sasha downed her drink. She winced as the liquid burned her throat. A warmth was building in her stomach. Two shots down in less than 20 minutes, she knew she needed to pace herself or this night wasn't gonna go very far. She knew tequila was dangerous. She'd heard stories of people doing crazy things when they drank a little too much of it. She made a quick mental note not to have another drink for a while. So we see all the she's, she, 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 she. We got one, two, three, four, five, six in a small paragraph. How do we revise it? Again, by telling yourself to actively space out the gaps between she. So in the revised, we're gonna use her name a little bit more. We're gonna kind of space out the name and she just to kind of break it up a little. Sasha downed her drink, wincing as the liquid burned the back of her throat. A warmth slowly built in her stomach. Two shots down in less than 20 minutes. She needed to pace herself or this night wouldn't go very far. Tequila was a dangerous alcohol. She'd heard stories of the crazy things that people had done after drinking too much. Setting the glass down, she made a mental note not to have another drink for a while. So we cut that six she's down to three. We didn't have to repeat her name too many times there. I think we only have one use of her name in that paragraph. That's a huge trim down from the six that we had in the previous paragraph. Actively giving yourself that space is gonna do that. And that's something you do in your revising process that helps trim out that echo. Now, crutch words I mentioned at the very beginning. Crutch words are the words that are comfortable to us. They're the ones that we lean on, the ones that we throw in without even thinking of it. But when we overuse crutch words, they become an echo. So we kind of need to have a list going as we write, and especially as we go and re we reread what we've written. You'll notice it a lot when you're actively rereading something that you've used a word over and over and over. And when you notice that there is a word that you continue to use over again, that's your crutch word. Write it down. Because when you're done with your, your first draft and you're ready to move on to the next, you can do the search and destroy looking for that word and finding ways to remove it. And whether that's just removing the word like with really and just, or whether that's restructuring the sentence so that you don't need to use that word, creating that space, that gap space between the, the uses of that word, because we are going to use the crutch words more than anything else, but we don't have to always put them tightly packed together. So this list here, just like with the previous ones I gave you, this isn't a complete list, but it's to give you a good start on the words that are most commonly used and leaned on as a crutch in our writing. And you can go through and use that search and destroy and find the word and see what you want to do with it. You're going to come up with your own. Uh, one of the books that I edit, uh, right now I'm editing a series, and in that series, the um, every time the door is shut or opened, the character shoves it and that's become their crutch. They're always shoving a door open or shoving a door closed. So that is the crutch that they use. And I mark it down so that the author knows, hey, this is a crutch that you're overusing. When you go back through along with the edits I'm giving you, you need to look for the usage of shoved. That is your crutch. Find ways to describe closing a door without having to shove it all the time. And you don't always have to tell everyone how you open or close a door unless it's important. So sometimes it's a quick snip. You don't need to shove the door open. You can just open the door. So again, use this list as a baseline. Start going through your manuscript and figure out what your crutches are and keep those on list. That way, when you go through and do your self-editing, you'll be able to find them and spot them and get rid of them. 
The next thing, along with crutches, is redundancy. And a lot of this has to do with colloquialism, but we have a tendency when we write to throw in comfortable phrases. And a lot of times those comfortable phrases are actually redundant, meaning doublespeak. You're not needing to spell it out the way that you are. One word will do instead of two, like advanced warning. Well, a warning is advanced. So it's ahead of the trouble. You don't need to say advanced warning. You can just say warning. Uh, collaborate together, that's another one of my favorites. And I, I'm guilty of that one. But when you are collaborating, you are collaborating with someone else together. You don't need to say that. You can just say, we collaborated. Uh, close proximity. That is a personal crutch of mine. I say it all the time and I am trying to smack my hand every time I do it and stop because close proximity. Again, if you are close, that is proximity to the thing that you're close to. You don't need to say both. Basic essentials, another one. The basic things that you need are the essentials. You don't need to repeat them. Uh, speaking of repeat, repeat again. If you are repeating something, you are saying it again. You don't need to say it. Repeat again. You can say, I repeated. So going through and, and looking at the list of redundancies and getting rid of those is going to help tighten up your sentences. It's going to make your sentences read a lot more cleanly. It's not going to waste extra words and bloat your manuscript with unnecessary things. And a lot of times we find when it's our first manuscript, especially, we go too far into descriptions. We say too much for fear that the reader's not going to understand us. The thing is, and you learn this as you go along, being clear and concise will actually go a lot further than trying to over explain yourself. And sometimes giving just a little bit is exactly what the reader needs to be able to imagine the rest. So doing the self-editing process and really trimming down the fat by getting rid of echoes and redundancies makes your work cleaner, clearer, and a lot easier for the reader to just dive right into. Another thing we do with redundancies, and again, I'm guilty of this. This is why these are on my lists of things to look for. And this is my personal list. When I go through and I do my self-editing checks, I go down this exact same list. I look for my bloat words. I look for my echoes. I look for my crutch words. I look for my redundancies. And I get all of those taken care of so that it's a cleaner manuscript before I even move on to the next process. Now, in the acronym world, there are a lot of acronyms that we use that we, we are redundant because we don't remember what the acronym stands for. And so a lot of times ATM machine is one of the biggest ones. Again, I use this and I'm smacking my hand every time I do it, which is why it's on my list. ATM machine stands for automatic teller machine. You don't need the added machine in there. Don't put that in yours. LCD, liquid crystal display. You don't need the display after that, okay? Look at the acronyms that you add in and make sure you're not adding the redundant extra word at the end. That is a simple, simple fix that you can just easily cut and make your sentence clearer and reduce some of that bloated word count. The next one, and again, this one I had to, to learn the hard way and smack my hand a few times on. But when we're talking about dialogue, there's a lot of tendency in dialogue to want to clarify who we're talking to. But if you're using the character's name repeatedly, it's unnecessary. Pay attention to how you speak to somebody. Really pay attention. When you talk to somebody that you're familiar with, you know, you run into them at the coffee shop, how do you address them? Do you repeat their name over and over? Do you even bother saying their name? I know for me, a lot of times I run into somebody that I haven't seen in forever and forgive me, I forget the name. I've always been bad with names. And I will actively have a conversation where I will try and get them to say their name because I can't remember it. Or I will avoid names altogether so that I don't have to show that I've forgotten a name because I'm so embarrassed by the fact that I've forgotten the name. But if you pay attention, this is a great rule to apply to your writing. Pay attention to how you speak to someone. See how often you actually use somebody's name and then apply that to your writing. Now, the example up here, this was a funny one, and this is not my example. This is one that, that was given to me early on in, in my writing career, and it stuck with me. 
And this is, imagine again, two people talking, having a conversation. You get George and Brenda. Hello, George, Brenda said. Ah, greetings, Brenda, George said. Lovely weather we're having today. Wouldn't you agree, George? Brenda said. Absolutely, Brenda. Perfect day for a picnic, George said. Smashing idea, George, Brenda said. See how silly that sounds? Constantly repeating the name over and over and over. We don't need that. So keep that example in your mind when you're writing dialogue. And when you're tempted to use that character's name in your dialogue, ask yourself, if I was having this conversation, would I actually say the character's name? Nine times out of 10, you won't. Now, there are some caveats on that. If it is a uh, um, professional setting and you need to address somebody by their professional name, usually with a title, absolutely do it once. You don't have to do it every single time unless it is a situation that calls for that. If you're writing like um, um, murder mystery or police procedural, you may be addressing somebody as agent or officer or detective. A lot of times you won't always use their name. Sometimes you'll just use their last name. But in those cases, yes, it is more acceptable to have the name there in the dialogue. But if it's just every day conversation between two people, you don't. Nine times out of ten, you do not. So keep that in mind. Now, the other caveat on that one is if there are more than two people talking and you need to direct a specific line of dialogue to a specific person, then yes, use their name. But this one's used sparingly. And only in those circumstances where you need to call that character's attention to the dialogue being spoken. So if you got a group setting and you, hey, George over here, he's the one that said this, you're going to use his name. But if you're just having a conversation between those people, usually it's the dialogue tag that will tell you who is speaking and it's a group setting. So they're all speaking together. Use that very, very sparingly. All right. That is the basics to our self-editing. Now, if you notice, self-editing is not the same as editing. We're not going after the grammar, the punctuation, all the stuff that your editor will do. This is trimming the fat. This is clarifying your sentences. This is getting rid of bloat words, unnecessary, lazy modifiers. All that stuff that makes your work sound a little bit overbloated, a little bit harder to understand, or that is more telling than showing. Self-editing for you is cleaning up the manuscript so it is ready to move on to that editor because you always, always, always hire an editor if you are self-publishing. You always need that professional set of eyes to look over and make sure that you're following all of the grammar rules, the style style rules, whether that be CMOS or AP style. Um, you need to make sure that you've got a pro doing that. What you're doing is cleaning it up so it is ready for them. And why do we do that? Because an editor is a human, and human eyes can only see so much. They will miss things. And the more that your editor has to do to find the problems in your manuscript, the more chances are that they might miss something or that it needs an extra pass. I'm sure many of you out there have read a traditionally published book and found there are problems there. That's because human eyes can only catch so many things. There's always going to be one or two mistakes out there. It's more common for there to be more mistakes if you hand an editor a manuscript that just needs so much work that they can't see the, the grammatical problems. If the sentences are too wordy and too um, long and drawn out, they can't always see all the problems that need to be fixed there. So when you clean up your manuscript and make it as nice and tight and concise and clear as possible, your editor has a better shot of catching more of those mistakes. And this also goes if you're planning on going into the traditional model of publishing. When you present a manuscript to an editor or to an agent for consideration, you want it as clean and as beautiful as possible. So by doing these steps, you are getting yourself primed into the right position for your manuscript to be accepted and move on to that next stage of publishing. So always remember, Self-editing is for you. It is for the cleaning of your manuscript, the making it as beautiful as possible. It does not mean your manuscript is ready to be published yet. You still need to take the next step, whether that's traditional and going through an agent and their editor to get it out there, or whether that is through the next step of hiring an editor yourself to get it ready 
for publishing in the independent market. All right. I hope that was helpful for you guys. I have a bunch more in this StoryCraft series that I'm going to be sharing with you. If you would like to find me, please reach out on social media. I am also a publishing consultant through my Rising Sign books. You can find me at risingsignbooks.com. If you want to pick up, write and edit the damn book. Again, it includes all of those wonderful word swaps and those charts on your sensory words. And there's a lot in there about body language as well as a primer on punctuation, which will help you get some of that cleaned up before it goes to the editor. Please stop by anywhere that you pick up books and either get it in print or an ebook. We have write and edit the damn book followed by go publish yourself, your quick and dirty tips for successful self-publishing. I will see you next time, and I thank you so much for hanging out with me today and going over some self-editing practices. Good luck on your manuscript, guys. Thank you.